Hi, I'm Rob Word. Welcome to a special edition of A Word on Westerns. Today we honor those friends and filmmakers who passed in 2020. We were lucky that so many of them were able to join us for interviews and conversations to share their memories of making Westerns. Today, we'll share them with you. I said, look, fellas, we shoot an hour pilot. You know we're going to be losing money. They're not going to give us the money that we're going to spend on the pilot. It's an hour pilot, then maybe nobody will see it if it doesn't sell, and it's done for. I know how we can get in the black right from the beginning. I said, yeah, that sounds interesting. How? I said, we do a two-hour movie, a feature film. I go to Bob Whiteman and Courtney. We have lunch together. Whiteman said to me, look, you got, you're getting, lining up a pretty good cast for this feature. And uh, he said, but you know what? You haven't got a star. You've got to get a star. And I said, w what star? He said, uh, Robert Taylor. I said, Robert Taylor? Quo Vadis, Camille, Johnny Eager. He's, he's gonna, he's gonna, there's no part in this for him. Whiteman says, let him play Gallagher. I said, Gallagher, Gallagher, I was thinking about Jim Davis doing Gallagher, and you want me to try and get Robert Taylor? He said, try, we'll pay him the money. We know how much he gets. Get him. He said, all right, <laughs> get him. Uh, well, I didn't want to go through his agent, but uh, Jimmy Drury, who was a good friend of mine, is a friend of Robert Taylor's. He gave me Taylor's telephone number. I call him up at home, and Mr. Taylor answers the phone himself. I said, Mr. Taylor, my name is Andrew Fennedy. He says, oh yeah, yeah, I know about you. Well, what's on your mind? I said, well, sir, we're gonna do a feature and it's also gonna be a pilot and uh, uh, we'd like you to read the script. If you, if, if you would read the script and we'll, we'll pay your price. Uh, and he said, well, uh, all right, send it over. So I send it over and I figured, well, I'll never hear from that man again. That's hello and goodbye. But he called, he called and he said, Andrew, I really liked this script. He loved Westerns too, didn't oh, he? Oh, he did a lot of Westerns, uh, absolutely. He played Billy the Kid at one time. Anyhow, he said, I'd like to talk to you about it. Can we have lunch? And I said, yeah, can, you want to come over here? Sure. I, he said, but let's not eat in the commissary. I said, all right. So I made arrangements to eat near Courtney's office. They had it catered and all that. <laughs> and Taylor is a chain smoker. So so is Courtney, and I have got my cigar. Cigars are harmless, though. Anyhow, <laughs> through this cloud of smoke, I, I said to Taylor, I said, I understand why you don't want to go into the commissary. You'll probably get mobbed. And he said, no, no, that's not it. And I said, what? He said, too many ghosts. Oh, the gables and the garbos and all of Anyhow, but he said, look, fellas, I would like to play Hondo. Wow. Well, Courtney and I looked at each other because we had mentioned him as Hondo to the network before Tager, and they said, nah, 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 he's too old, he's too this, he's too that. So I said, well, I'm sorry, sir, but uh, that part's already cast. But look, I'm working on the part of Gallagher that we sent you, and I'm going to put a son in there for you to have conflict with the son, and you're going to have a strike at the mine. And he said, Andy, 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 look, he said. My agent will probably kill me, he said, but I'll do this. Uh, but don't screw up your script on account of me. I'll do it. And that's how we got Robert Taylor. I'll tell you something else. Well, you tell me, Krantz. Is the Army going to protect a mine? He's studying on it. But it looks like we might have to protect ourselves. Not me. Not you is right, you jelly spine. You're fired. Why, you... <laughs> She made her first television appearance in a Western. It was Sheriff of Cochise. And Sheriff of Cochise was a syndicated series. It ran for a couple of years starring John Bromfield and was very successful for some weird reason after a couple of years and, and 78 episodes, which was two seasons back then. It's got to be 12 seasons now. 
uh, they changed the name to uh, U.S. Marshall. Jackie did one of each, and both of them were directed by the great Robert Altman. So tell us about that. Was that a fast shoot in those days? Two yeah. and a half days. <laughs> That's a fast shoot. When I first got to work, I saw this man wandering. I couldn't find anything or anybody. And so this guy was wandering around, and I said, uh, do you know if there's any makeup or wardrobe or anywhere around here? And he said, I don't know. There's a lot going on under a tree over there, so why don't you check that out? So I go over, and I thought he was one of the crew, you know. He was very nice, very polite. And then I go to work, and there he is. He's the director. And that was Robert Altman. Yeah. Because uh, he's known for his, his feature films like, like Nashville and uh, MASH, where he gives the actors so much freedom to create and bring things to the role. Was he like that on television, too? I said he was one of the best directors. He really was one of the best directors I ever worked with. Um, long before MASH, people would say, who's the best director you ever worked with? And I'd say... There's this guy I did, uh, uh, what was it? Sheriff of Cochise, U.S. <laughs> no, Marshal. No, it wasn't the Sheriff of Cochise, it was U.S. Marshal. There you go, right there. <laughs> I said, this guy that I did a U.S. Marshal with. Well, they'd look at me like I was crazy, you know. Then MASH came out, and they realized why I thought he was one of the best directors I ever worked with. And they have a sense. They love actors, and they understand actors. And they just watch you until you get in trouble. And then they'll come in and help you out and straighten you out and you can get on with your business, you know. But they're not constantly bothering you, trying to tell you what to do, to and you'll be better than you've ever been in your life. Fred's Western was uh, sort of a takeoff on Shane, written by Eugene Levy, called Sodbusters, yes. and Chris Christopherson had the Alan Ladd role, Yes, and you were Van Heflin. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and working with Chris Christopherson, um, well, to begin with, I, I, I'm not a horse person. They took us all out to ride horses one day just to get accustomed to the horse. When I first came out to Hollywood, uh, I, I decided that I would go and take riding lessons I, I don't know if the place is still there, and some old guy would give riding lessons. <laughs> First thing he told us one night is, a horse is an extremely dumb animal. <laughs> it'll, fly, it'll jump right off a cliff. If it sees a snake, it might go right over a cliff. So this didn't calm my nerves any when I, I had to get on the horse. <laughs> so, but I, I figured like an actor, I had to know how to ride. No, 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 no. everything but take dueling <laughs> lessons. I didn't, I think it was past the time when they, they dueled in film. No, as an actor, all you have to do is say you know how to ride. Yeah. Okay. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah, uh, they never asked me that. They just said, you're going to ride in this one. I, I, and it's, I was always amazed at how high up it is when oh, you yeah. get on a horse. Especially if you fall down. Yeah. yeah. I, I, luckily, I never felt. But uh, Chris Christopherson, when he got on the horse and his spur caught oh. in the um, stirrup? The stirrup. And I thought they were gonna it was going to kick him off. And I, oh, my God, if this happens to Chris Christopherson, <laughs> what's going to happen to me? It didn't phase him, though. It didn't phase him. And then one night, I had to drive the horse down to the cabin and stop and get off. And Eugene came over and he, he said, Cut, he says, Fred, I want you to stop the over here, the horse over here. I said, don't tell me, tell the horse. <laughs> the horse was completely in charge. <laughs> I, I was uh, afraid of the horse. I wanted to treat it very gently and I found out you can't. You have to let it know who's the boss. Uh, but in the script it said that there was a, a uh, uh, we were supposed to have a fight, uh, me and uh, Chris Gustafsson. Then he was going to run away, and I was going to jump on a horse and chase him. And it was a night sh shoot. And I said, well, I, I, they must know what they're doing. But Chris Gustafsson said, oh, I don't like that, galloping at night. And I just realized, you know, I guess it's a horse could stumble. And, and I said, if Chris Gustafsson is afraid, I, <laughs> I'm afraid too. But I think they either cut it out of the movie or, or, or use stuntmen for it. Um, but we did, the, the fight that proceeded, we did have a fight late at night, and you know, it was choreographed, and, I, and he had to be knocked down and twist, and uh, we did it about three times. Then it was about three o'clock in the morning, and he had his own driver to drive him back into downtown Toronto. And uh, he'd, he'd always pull up to my dressing room, he said, Fred, you want to ride? 
I said, well, sure. And I'd say, I'd get in the car, I said, now, do you want to talk or just be quiet? Went, well, a little bit of both, you know. So this <laughs> night, it took about 45 minutes uh, driving in. We got out of the car, and he says, I think I broke my toe. I said, what? He hadn't said a word about it. And the next day, he came in, I said, well, how's your toe? He said, yeah, it's broke. He said, hey, uh. I said, my God, I would have spent the night in the hospital. I would have demanded to go to an emergency room. I want to ask about Bruce Lee. I don't know where I met Bruce uh, the first time, and uh, um, well, he, we became kind of friendly, and uh, the next thing I was, I was in, uh, back back in uh, Hong Kong, working a film with Bruce Lee, and uh, it was quite interesting. We, you know, we worked together uh, a lot, and it was lots of time to wait to do what we wanted to do, and uh, uh, what else can I tell you about? Well, that? you were quite accomplished yourself uh, in the martial arts, weren't you? Yeah, I had uh, uh, long before. Uh, were you surprised at how successful it became? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't take long afterwards because it became, I think, universal, not universal, it was uh, Warner, Brothers. Warner Brothers. Yeah, that's right. And it was a big film, big, 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 important film. Uh, I, Library of Congress actually uh, considered it what? What do they call it? It's in the library. In the Library of Congress about this film. Well, it deserves to be there. When it first came out, it it was an immediate phenomenon. Big success. Yeah. And Bruce passed away shortly after that. Ay, 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 yeah. Why? You're right. I left. I left Hong Kong, uh, and came back to home. And uh, one time uh, the fa phone rang and, uh, and uh, I said, well, who, who is it? Well, he said, it's Bruce. I said, oh, Bruce, where are you? He says, I'm going uh, to the doctor. I said, the doctor? Uh, why? He says, well, uh, there may not be a Bruce Lee anymore. And uh, I, let, I put the phone down and and found out that he was calling again. And the last, next time he came to call me, he said, everybody's great. They think it's great. I'm going to be great in the film and so on and so forth. And he left back to Hong Kong and he died shortly after. I don't really understand why. Yeah. I don't want to talk for too long, uh, but I just want to say that the presence of everybody here today is an honor, not only for me, but also for the director um, of this great movie and the producer of this and other beautiful movies. I get this call from uh, the agent said, well, Bert, uh, Bert Kennedy called. 
he, uh, he, he, he wants to talk to you. He says, I, I'm doing this uh, Western movie called uh, Kate Bliss and the Ticket Tape Kid. I said, gee, that's one of them. He says, you want to wear a big hat? I said, oh, I'd love to. And boy, I mean, my heroes are there. Harry Morgan, Buck Taylor, Gene Evans, and we had Suzanne Plachet, Tony Randall, and, uh, David Huddleston, stuff like It was just fabulous. And, and Bert, I have to tell you, I used to go visit him quite a bit, and uh, there was something about Bert came from a background uh, as, as a writer and an actor and a, and a very strong military career. But he had the sense, uh, the same thing uh, that Kevin Spacey does, that Jack Lemmon once told him. And uh, Jack Lemmon says, well, once you get to a certain level, boy, he says, send the elevator back down. Send the elevator back down. And that meant once you've tasted a little bit, bring somebody else up. Bring them up. Put them in front of a camera. Give them a job. And that's what, that's what this town used to be. If you turn in a good job for somebody, bingo. You got that job. And you had an opportunity, uh, and they're still like Eastwood. Eastwood will use the same people over for 20, 30 years. There are a handful of these people left, and God bless Bert Kennedy for looking after me all those days that he did. Where you are, my friend, I know you're up there in a saddle and smiling down on all of us today, and you can't have a hamburger. <laughs> During 2020, we also lost performers who had not yet appeared on a word on Westerns. Here are some of those who deserve to be recognized. Baby Peggy appeared in 150 short films and starred in nine feature films, including the 1924 silent classic, Captain January. In 1975, she wrote Hollywood Posse and other books depicting life in early Hollywood under the name Diana Sarah Carey. Wilfred Brimley started his film career as a horseback riding stuntman in westerns during the 1960s. During lean times, he was a farrier, a horseshoer, and even played one in a kung fu episode. But the camera loved Wilford, and he soon became a much-in-demand character actor in such films as The China Syndrome, Absence of Malice, and Cocoon. His westerns include TV's How the West Was Won, Rodeo Girl, All My Friends Are Cowboys, Good Old Boys, Blood River, and Crossfire Trails with his friend Tom Selleck. Brimley was awarded a Golden Boot Award for his contributions to the western genre in 2005. As parking lot attendant Kooky on the early Warner Brothers TV hit 77 Sunset Strip, Ed Burns found instant stardom. His westerns include just about everything on the Warner Brothers lot. Cheyenne, Maverick, Colt 45, Sugarfoot, Lawman, and the color feature Yellowstone Kelly with Clint Walker and John Russell. His spaghetti westerns include Payment in Blood, Any Gun Can Play, and Professionals for a Massacre. Before landing the seminal role of secret agent James West on The Wild Wild West in 1965, Robert Conrad had been a milkman, a boxer, and a co-star in the Warner Brothers detective series Hawaiian Eye. Successfully created as a James Bond out west, the Wild Wild West was notable for Conrad performing many of his own stunts. It paired him with versatile actor Ross Martin as his colorful sidekick and partner Artemis Gordon. The series had a four-year run and spawned two TV movies, both directed by Burt Kennedy and still extremely popular today. Conrad also appeared in The Bandits, a western shot in Mexico, and in the miniseries Centennial as Pascanel. Ben Cooper is remembered for his many western films as juvenile, sometimes juvenile delinquent leads. On Broadway at the age of nine in Life with Father, Ben was soon spending his spare time riding horses and playing cowboys. His draw was fast, and he was soon in Hollywood appearing in Nicholas Ray's cult noir classic, Johnny Guitar. Signed by Republic Pictures, many westerns followed, including The Last Command, 
The Outpost, and The Lead in Duel at Apache Wells. His two with Audie Murphy are Gunfight at Comanche Creek and Arizona Raiders. TV westerns include Death Valley Days, The Westerner, Bonanza, Rawhide, Laramie, multiple episodes of Gunsmoke, among many others. Ben received a Golden Boot Award in 2005. Argentinian Linda Crystal made her American film debut with a small role in Comanche, a 1956 color western starring Dana Andrews. Other western parts included The Last of the Fast Guns with Jocko Mahoney and The Fiend Who Walked the West with Hugh O'Brien. Roles in John Wayne's The Alamo and John Ford's Two Road Together lifted her profile, but when she auditioned for the part of Victoria Montoya, producer David Dortort immediately cast her for his new series, The High Chaparral. The popular western ran for four years and is still seen daily in syndication. Crystal won a Golden Globe in 1970 as Best Actress in a Drama and garnered two Emmy nominations for her role in The High Chaparral. Two-time Academy Award winner Olivia de Havilland was indeed a superstar from Hollywood's golden age. Born in Tokyo, Japan to British parents, Olivia and her sister, actress Joan Fontaine, were raised in California. Signed to a seven-year contract at Warner Brothers in 1935, Olivia was paired with another newcomer, Errol Flynn. Together, they starred in eight films, including the westerns, Dodge City, Santa Fe Trail, and they died with their boots on. Her other westerns include The Proud Rebel with Alan Ladd and an episode of TV's The Big Valley. De Havilland was nominated for a Best Supporting Actress for Gone with the Wind, but lost to Hattie McDaniels. In Brian Dennehy's role as a bigoted sheriff in the blockbuster hit First Blood, the six foot three inch actor created a lasting impression for audiences and casting directors. His appearance as another ruthless lawman in the super western Silverado was a big hit for his fans. The two time Tony Award winning actor never deserted his love of the stage and balanced his career between live theater and film work. The legend Kirk Douglas was indeed a superstar. The actor, producer, writer tackled every genre and seemingly always succeeded. His forceful presence, both on screen and off, left a legacy of memories for lovers of film. Kirk Douglas starred in many westerns. His first was 1951's Along the Great Divide, directed by Raoul Walsh. Paired multiple times with another superstar, Burt Lancaster, their on-screen chemistry was explosive. Together, for the first time in 1957, they were Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday in John Sturge's classic, Gunfight at the OK Corral. Kirk also went western with John Wayne in The War Wagon, with Robert Mitchum and Richard Woodmark in The Way West, and even a gunfight with Johnny Cash. Kirk was honored with a Golden Boot Award in 1999, who said at the time that his favorite film was the modern Western, Lonely Are the Brave. James Jury will forever be known as The Virginian, starring as the title character in the 90-minute hit Western series from 1962 to 1971. An expert horseman, Jury was at home in the saddle and raised Appaloosas when he retired from acting. In Sam Peckinpah's first classic, 1962's Ride the High Country, Drury's intense portrayal as one of the nefarious Hammond brothers was a real departure from the Shiloh Ranch foreman he was to portray on The Virginian later that same year. A few of his other Western credits are roles on many TV classics, including Death Valley Days, The Texan, Gunsmoke, Have Gun Will Travel, Rawhide, Lawman, and Wagon Train. Drury was honored with a Golden Boot Award in 1995. German-born John Erickson may be best known for his role as sidekick to Anne Francis in the cult spy series Honey West. At six foot two inches, Erickson fit the bill for a leading man and director Jose Farrar cast the young actor in the lead role on Broadway in Stalag 17. 
a part that went to William Holden in the film version in his Oscar-winning role. In the classic Spencer Tracy drama shot in Lone Pine, California, Bad Day at Black Rock, Erickson joined a stellar cast that included Robert Ryan, Lee Marvin, Ernest Borgnine, Scott Brady, and his future Honey West, Anne Francis. At six feet, six and a half inches tall, Anthony James first came to my attention as the distinctively sleazy racist in his first movie, the Academy Award winning In the Heat of the Night. Boy, was he memorably creepy. After that, James kept popping up in all variety of films, but for me, it was his Western parts in Culpepper Cattle Company and as a bullwhip flailing outlaw in Clint Eastwood's High Plains Drifter that solidified his presence as one of the screen's best villains. His TV Western appearances include Gunsmoke, Bonanza, The High Chaparral, Cimarron Strip, and The Big Valley. James bookended his career with another Best Picture Oscar winner. His last film was Eastwood's Unforgiven. He played Skinny Dubois, the sleazy owner of the bordello. Texas-born, Grammy-winning singer-actor Kenny Rogers loved music, and he loved westerns, too. His successful music career took him from being a member of the new Christie Minstrels to leading the rock group the first edition to headlining on his own before starring in a TV movie franchise, The Gambler. It was based on his number one song hit and created by writer-producer Jim Burns. Set in the Old West, Rogers played Brady Hawks, a poker player who receives a letter from his son in need of help. On his journey, Hawks picks up Billy Montana, played by Western stalwart Bruce Boxleitner. The Gambler was so successful, it spawned a series of four equally popular sequels starring the pair. Rogers' other Westerns include Wild Horses, Rio Diablo, and an episode of Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. Stuart Whitman was nominated for an Academy Award as Best Actor for The Mark. His role? was that of a convicted child molester. But, due to as many Westerns, it is that genre for which he is best remembered. Small Parts on the Roy Rogers Show was a boost to the young actor, as was a recurring role in the syndicated hit Highway Patrol. Stewart's early guest spots on TV Westerns include Gunsmoke, Have Gun Will Travel, Track Down, and Dick Powell's Zane Gray Theater. Following his Oscar nomination in 1961, Whitman was cast opposite John Wayne in Michael Curtiz's last film, The Common Cheros. Another popular Western feature, Rio Conchos, cast Whitman alongside Richard Boone and Jim Brown. Whitman even produced his 90-minute TV Western, Cimarron Strip. It boasted motion picture-like cast and quality. Thank you for joining us. And I'd like to thank all of the people that we lost for sharing their memories with us, too. We'll see you next time. And we're going to make this a very, very good year. Mm -hmm.